2008, uh, the New York Times ran an article uh, about a woman who had developed quite a following. Uh, she blogged about her life and her marriage and her family. And the reason the article was written was this woman, after an accident, uh, her loyal followers had contributed over $100,000 to aid in her recovery. And so this was rather remarkable. It was kind of a, a, a social question at the time. Um, can uh, people who only have a relationship with people virtually, online, um, can they really know? And can, can, are these relationships legitimate? And, you know, in 2008, this was a bit newer. And so the New York Times, upon hearing that they'd, her followers had given this $100,000, they dispatched a reporter. Go and find out what's going on. Go and find out how they really feel. And so this reporter... Uh, goes and, and talks to some of the donors, to men and women who had given to this lady to help in her recovery. And, and the question was, you know, how do you feel about donating money to someone that you don't even know and that you've never even met? And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly the response was, I do know her. I've been watching and following her life. I know her kids' names. I know who her husband is. I know many of her routines. Uh, that these online friends are really no different than friends that I have in person. So intrigued, the reporter, of course, uh, decided to dig a little bit deeper. And so the reporter called the woman of the sister, I'm sorry, the sister of this woman, and began to speak to her about her life, to find out just how much of this woman's life that her followers really knew. Now, it didn't take long to find out that the woman's life with her husband and her kids uh, wasn't nearly as perfect as she had portrayed it to be. Rather, she'd only chosen to write about the positive and charming aspects of their life. She had left behind the struggles and the difficulties and the uncertainties, the, the painful times, in favor of presenting that which was truly best. And while her followers, I mean, they, they had a sense, maybe, of who she was, um, they didn't know the true her. Her sister knew the true her, imperfections and all. Now this week as we continue our series called This Is Us, where we're just kind of pulling back the curtain and saying, hey, here are the core values of our church. We've said that we are going to be unapologetically biblical. It's who we are. It's who God has called us to be. And where the Word speaks it, we're going to stand on that. And we're not going to be shifted uh, by every wave and wind of culture that might ultimately come our way. Uh, we've said that this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. You don't have to come to church and put on a face here. Uh, if you're hurting, you're struggling, you're addicted, whatever sin you may be in, it's okay to not be okay. It's simply not okay to stay there because we believe in the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He is the doctor who leads us back to hell. So it's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. We've said that we are a church that is going to make disciples and not just settle for converts. What we're not going to celebrate here is merely people that walk an aisle. So what you're not going to experience is a bunch of high-pressure invitations where we do our best to make you feel really guilty so you'll cry out to God and then think, okay, we've got you there. Um, you're going to see at this church that we are going to consistently call you to follow Jesus Christ with 100% of your life. And so Jesus ought to be just as present in your finances as he is your Sunday morning worship. He ought to be just as present in your job as he is with your family. We follow Jesus with our whole lives. And so we're going to consistently challenge you to live a full life of wholehearted discipleship following after Jesus. Now this week, the value that we want to present to you is that as a church, we bet the farm on community. And you might think that's a little bit of an odd phrase, but what we want you to see is that when it comes to discipleship, we believe that takes place in the context of community. I love what I'm doing here. I enjoy to preach to you. I enjoy to give you the word. And we think this is critical. God has called us to gather here and worship. But I am under no illusions that somehow what happens here in one hour on a Sunday morning is going to develop us into the disciples 
disciples that Jesus has called us to be. If you remember the model of Jesus, it was come and follow me. It wasn't a a sermon and then I'm going to leave, but rather with his disciples, it was come and share life with me. They had meals together. They traveled together. They did ministry together. And so discipleship is something that happens not when we gather just here on Sunday. And by the way, we hope that God blesses your heart and and encourages you and challenges you at times, convicts you of sin as we gather here. But we know that living the life of a disciple is something that happens in relationship outside of this gathering. And so when it comes to making fully devoted disciples, we bet the farm on community. Now, you might think, what is community? And I'm going to do my best uh, to, to define that for you biblically so that you'll have an understanding of what ultimately we're calling you to. The biblical ideal of community, it challenges us to commit ourselves to life together as the people of God. That rather than just having people that we sit next to in the, in the seat on a Sunday We have people that we intentionally walk through life with, that we pursue Jesus Christ together. The biblical ideal of community, it moves us beyond comfortable, isolated, private lives and instead invites us into a deep, rich, abiding relationship with other believers where we know others and we are truly known. Can I ask you a question? Do people really know the true you? Do they know the good, bad, and the ugly? Do they know know the struggles and the fears and the hopes and desires and dreams? Or kind of like the blogger lady, do they know the most presentable parts of you? Do they know the good, the positive, the charming, without really knowing who you really are behind the facade? Biblical community calls us to know others deeply, and to be known. Tim Keller explains why many of us settle for shallow, superficial relationships. And he says, he opens with that idea. He says, to be loved but not known is superficial. To be loved but not known, it's superficial. Uh, What that means is that we can never truly feel loved because... People don't know the true us. They know what we present. They know the good parts. They know the facade. And they love that, but that's not who we really are. So to be loved but not known is is superficial. But for most of us, to be known but not loved is a nightmare. We're afraid deep down that if people knew the real us, that they wouldn't love us. If people knew the real us, they wouldn't want to spend time with us. They might think terrible things about us. They might even agree with some of those deepest thoughts that we have about ourselves that we're not enough. We're too much of this and we're not enough of that and we're not living life even to the standard that we think that we should hold it up to. And so rather than allow ourselves to be known, we hide. But here's the beauty. The gospel of Jesus Christ tells us a different story. Tim Keller goes on and points out, he says, The gospel says that you are simultaneously more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe, and yet you are more loved and accepted than you ever dared to hope. We are a community of people more sinful than most of us would ever want to admit. And yet in Christ Jesus, far more love than we could ever comprehend. That's who the church is. And we are united by the gospel. We are not united by our superior behavior here. We are not united by, uh, you know, religious fervor here. We are united at the foot of the cross by the saving grace of Jesus Christ, which saw all of us in our sin. And yet God... He chose to love us anyway, and he extended his love, grace, and mercy to us. Most clearly, by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross that we might find new life in him. And when we come back together, and we live lives of true biblical community, in deep, rich, abiding relationships with one another, where we know others and we allow ourselves to be truly known, we are reflecting back. This Christ-like love and devotion one to another. Loving other people as Christ 
has loved us. So, we bet the farm on community. Now, I'm going to give you three reasons today why we do this and why we think it's so important that we live lives together in community. So, point number one that I want you to see is that God created us to live in community. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 42. Uh, but first, I want to go back a little further. I want to step back, if you will, and note that at the center of all reality, at the heart of the universe, there exists a community. God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. God exists as community in his three-in-oneness. The Father, Son, and Spirit exist in, in what's termed as kind of a divine dance, if you will. Each person of the Trinity, perfectly loving and glorifying and enjoying the other persons of the Trinity. God exists in community. And God, who exists as a community, he made us in his image. Male and female, he created us to live in community with other peoples. We see this uh, exhibited in the Garden of Eden. Where in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they walked and they talked with God. They lived in perfect relationship with God and with each other. They were perfectly known and yet perfectly loved. But if you remember what, what happened when sin entered in, Adam and Eve, they, they hid themselves first from God. And then they hid themselves from each other. They felt shame for the first time. And this inclination that rather than allowing ourselves to be known, that, that we can't let people know us because if they knew us, they might not truly love us. And so we hide, like Adam and Eve, we hide in our shame. But here's the beauty of it. Adam and Eve, they didn't fool God. And their sin did not make God not love them anymore. He knew the sin of Adam and Eve, just as he knows the sin of you and me. God's love for us isn't superficial. It's not based on what we bring to the table. It's not based on our own goodness, our religious fervor, our church attendance, or any other list of anything. God's love for us is based on his nature and his character. He's a God who doesn't love us superficially, but he loves us with his perfect divine love that is self-giving and self-sacrificial. Once again, this is seen most clearly in God sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross, offering himself as a substitutionary sacrifice for us. Jesus coming and bearing our sins, enduring our punishment, that we might be reconciled again and live in that right relationship with God. And because we now live in a right relationship with God, because we now are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, we have the opportunity to live in right relationship with one another. And we see this expressed. Y'all know the story of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes, Peter preaches the gospel, and on the day of Pentecost, some 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus Christ. And do you know what those 3,000 people, having been transformed by the gospel, do you know what they immediately devoted their lives to? Acts 2.42 says this. It says, and they devoted themselves. And by the way, devotion isn't something that happens every now and then. It's not a once a week kind of deal. Uh, husbands, your wives wouldn't consider you devoted if you only come home on Thursdays, right? Like you got to be there. You're their husband every single day. You're a father to your kids or a, a mother to your children, a wife to your husband. When you are there day in and day out, and, and even when physical distance takes you away, you're still devoted to them. You're thinking about them. You're communicating with them. You're theirs. You belong to them. In Acts 2.42, it says that these brand new believers in Christ, having been transformed by the gospel and now empowered by the Holy Spirit, they devoted themselves to two things, the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. The fellowship here, this is to one another, to each other. 
these people from every tribe, every tongue under heaven, they're all gathered in Jerusalem. They've been transformed by the gospel. They have different customs. They like different foods. I mean, they, they, they might vote different politically. I mean, they were different people. But because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they were brought together and devoted themselves to one another. This first expression of renewed community that we see in Acts chapter 2. The early church reconciled to God through the cross. And then empowered by the Spirit, they devoted themselves to God and each other. They were reflecting the nature of God to a world who was ultimately watching. Now, what did this fellowship look like? Because that's important, right? What what does community really look like? We see this in in 242. The the first thing that we see that community um, uh, looks like, or what they they did, was they devoted themselves to the Word. Now, it says apostles' teaching here in Acts 242 because they didn't have a written New Testament like we did, right? It It was transmitted to them in oral form. They had the teaching of Peter and James and John. They had the apostles' teaching. And so they would gather together um, Solomon's colonnade. They would hear the sermons, and then you're going to see that they would gather house to house. And they would talk about the word. They would discuss what was being taught. They would encourage each other based upon uh, what the apostles had been teaching them on these days. They gathered together, devoting themselves to one another. Read on here in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. These brand new believers in Jesus Christ. They didn't know the history of church. They didn't know how they were supposed to function. They only knew what happened as a result of the gospel and what the Holy Spirit worked in them. They devoted themselves to one another. Early community was centered around the word, around the apostles' teaching, and around the breaking of bread, which was the, one of the highest forms of social acceptance in the Jewish community. They shared meals in their homes together. They ate, and they drank, and they laughed, and they enjoyed one another. And when it was all over, I'm sure they got together. They cleaned up the house. They did the dishes together. They were sharing life with one another in mutual acceptance. And they weren't perfect, y'all. There were times when this was difficult. There were times when people showed up late. You know those people, right? They were showing up late, and we're all sitting around hungry, and the food's getting cold, but we need the potato salad before we can eat. Like, there were difficulties with this, and yet they devoted themselves to one another. They shared meals together in gladness. They were breaking bread, and it tells us that they were praying. In their homes, they shared their burdens and their concerns and their struggles together. They prayed together and for one another, for jobs and health and for the kids, for temptations, for loved ones that didn't know Jesus, for children who had gone astray. They devoted themselves to one another. It was centered around the word and the breaking of bread and prayer, and it continues on. Verse 43, And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. It was sitting around the word, breaking bread, prayer, around giving. Y'all, they weren't marginally sharing life together. They were selling their possessions and distributing to anyone who had need. This wasn't sort of devoted kind of fellowship. This was life on life. Your concerns are now my concerns. What God has given to me, I'm going to share with you in the same way that God has shared it with me. They were giving generously to one another. So, What this might look like in our culture, this is... Loaning you my lawnmower when I know you're the kind of guy that breaks stuff. You know what I mean? They were really living life together, giving and sharing. They were devoted to one another in this form of community. It goes on in verse 45 or verse 46, and it says, And day by day they were attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, and they received their food with glad and generous hearts, and they were praising God. When they would gather together, and they would talk about what God had done. They would tell the stories of how God had rescued them from their sin, how he delivered them from their addictions, of how God had had healed the sick. 
how he bound up the brokenhearted, how he restored a marriage and reconciled relationships. They were praising God together. They devoted themselves to the word and to this kind of fellowship. And there was one more component that we got to see, and that was mission. All that they had, man, this was deep, rich, abiding relationships with one another, but they didn't keep all that they had for themselves. Verse 47 says they were praising God and having favor with all the people. People on the outside were looking in at what was happening with these brand new believers, meeting in the temple and then gathering in homes and loving and praying for and giving to one another. And as a result of the way that they were interacting, the love that they had one for another, outsiders were looking in and they were like, hey, and that's remarkable. God must have done something. These people are different. It says they had favor with all of the people, and the Lord was adding to the number day by day those who were being saved. See, they didn't stay in their little holy huddles and their little circles where they had this extraordinary community. They were leaving there. They were going out into the community and in their jobs and in their schools, and they were taking the hope of Jesus Christ with them. They were sharing the gospel and inviting new people to come in and to enjoy what they were experiencing together. And don't think that this wasn't costly. Because just like our homes, first century homes, they were pretty small. You know, the kitchen's only so big. The dining room only seated so many people. And where all of these original 3,000 people had experienced Pentecost, tongues of fire, I mean, it was quite a day, right? They'd all been saved together. Do you know what had to happen rather quickly as God continued to add new people to their number? Those who had been united early on, those who had shared meals around the table and labored in prayer together, those who had worshipped together and given to one another, they had to look outside of themselves. They had to say, hey, we love what we have here, but we love these other people more. So I'm not going to be a part of breaking bread in your house anymore. I'm I'm going to go break bread at my house, and I'm going to invite new people in, and we're going to share this community with new people that, that haven't yet got to experience what God has for us in these deep, rich, abiding relationships with one another. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a group like this, Maybe you've been a part of something where it was a tight-knit group where, man, you enjoy the relationships. And then new people came in, and it changed things. Things got a little weird, right? Uh, You're not sure, like, can I really tell my story? Are these people trustworthy? It changes things. Bringing new people in was costly, but they did it. Until all across Jerusalem, thousands of people were meeting in hundreds of different homes. The light of the gospel showing all across that city. This was God's plan for discipleship. And then persecution happened in Jerusalem, and it scattered them outside of Jerusalem, all across Judea. And the church is existing in these little communities all across the region, and they continued to devote themselves to the Word, to breaking of bread, to prayer, to praising, to giving, and ultimately to going and sharing the gospel and bringing new people into that. We are likely here today. Because they quit meeting in Solomon's colonnade, right? Persecution happened. They couldn't gather in the temple. There was persecution in Jerusalem. They couldn't be open about it, but they kept meeting house to house. They did so wherever God would ultimately send them. Why do we bet the farm on community? It's because we were created for this, to live in deep, rich, abiding relationship with God and with one another. The second reason that we bet the farm on community is because discipleship happens in the context of relationship. It happens in the context of community. Y'all, I was pretty proud, 22 years old, when God called me into ministry, and he, through an extraordinary set of circumstances, he called me into full-time ministry. 22 years old, I was a single guy, I was a youth pastor, and I, I kind of thought I had life by the tail. You know, I had it going on. I, I was able to buy my own house. I had my own cars. Um, man, I spent a lot of time with students. Those were some extraordinarily blessed years. I got to see young people come to faith in Jesus and grow in their relationship with him. And if you would have asked me, hey, Jason, are you a pretty humble guy? Yeah, of course. Isn't that humble to say so? Uh, Jason, are you pretty selfless? Yeah. I mean, I've given my life to serving Jesus. Of course I'm selfless. Are you a pretty patient guy? I work with middle schoolers. Of course I'm patient. 
But then I met my wife and we got married. And Brittany moved into that house that I had bought where I had everything in the kitchen in a very specific spot. Where the schedule happened in the best possible way, at least according to me. Where I live my life on my own timeline. And within moments of being married, I realized that I wasn't nearly as humble or as patient or as kind or as loving or selfless as I thought I was. I could only entertain that illusion in isolation. I thought I was all of those things because I got everything my own way. Oh yeah, I'm patient, right? No, I wasn't patient. I just got my way. Things happened on my time scale, like in, in my own timing. I didn't have to be patient. Discipleship happens in the context of relationships. We learn how to be like Jesus as we interact with other people. Discipleship happens life on life, and it's not always easy. God uses other people to shape and to mold us and to conform us to the image of Jesus. I don't know if you've read the Bible, but the people in Jesus' life weren't always easy. Like Jesus is trying to teach, and some guy's like yelling at him, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. I mean, he had difficult people in his life. One of his 12 was the one that would betray him. And really, all of his disciples would when he got arrested. And Jesus did life with difficult people, and God has called us to do the same. And if you get into community, don't expect that it's going to be easy every day. You're going to get your feelings hurt. You're going to be frustrated by people. And I'm not sure that that isn't by design. Because every one of those times where someone disappoints you, or they show up late with the food, or they don't show up at all, and you're left with a house full of food. Every single time that happens, it's an opportunity to grow in Christ's likeness, to exercise patience, to exercise love and forgiveness, to bear with other people. We're never promised in the Scriptures that if, hey, you go be a part of the church and fellowship, you're never going to be wounded. But we are called over and over and over in Scriptures to model the love of Jesus for other people, I don't know how much of the New Testament you've read, but there are over 50 one another's in the New Testament. And we can't live out any of those in isolation. God intends for us to live in community, in relationship with other people, or else we literally couldn't fulfill all of these commands he's given us. I've got a few I want to put up on the screen. Um, as a believer in Jesus Christ, someone who says, I'm a Christian, I'm a disciple, I'm a follower of Jesus, here's what Jesus has called us to do for one another. We are called to love one another, to be devoted to one another, to honor one another, to live in harmony, to be at peace, to care for one another, to bear with one another, to comfort one another and encourage one another, to forgive one another, to pray and to confess sins to one another. We are to build up, instruct, teach, and admonish one another. We are to serve and to stir up and to submit to one another. We are to speak the truth in love to one another. Y'all, there are over 50 of these in the New Testament. Discipleship, obedience to these commands happens in the context of relationships. And if you happen to be here and you're like, man, I'm in a community group and these things aren't really happening. I would want to remind you that Jesus Christ has called each of us to these things. If this isn't happening, these things aren't happening in your community group. And just... Just look in the mirror and hold the person in the mirror responsible because you have been called to it as much as any other person. Maybe what needs to happen for your group is that you need to go first. Maybe you need to be the first to confess your sins and ask others to pray for you that you might be healed. Maybe you need to be the first to pursue others relationally and invest more deeply in their lives. Maybe... You need to go first at leading out in mission and sharing the gospel and bringing new people in. Maybe it's you that needs to go first in opening up your home and inviting others to come and to share a meal with you. Maybe you just need to be obedient to Jesus in the context of your own community. As a matter of fact, if you're here and you're a part of a community group and you're that person, and listen, we love you, we're not kicking you out, we're not angry, but you're the person that consistently shows up late or doesn't show up and doesn't make a phone call. 
and you don't seem to ever be able to bring any food. Or, uh, you know, you're the person that talks the entire time and no one else. Like, you should come together and repent. Man, turn your eyes toward other people. We should be serving other people as Jesus Christ has served and loved us in the context of community. It's in community that we are challenged and we are shaped and we're molded, that we grow and we're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So why do we bet the farm on community? Number one, because God created us for it. We were created to live in community. Number two, it's because discipleship happens in community, in the context of those relationships, which often get difficult. And number three, and this one's really important. I'm going to ask you to lean in here because this is critical for us as the leaders of your church. It's because we as elders really desire to faithfully shepherd the flock as the scriptures have called us to. I'm going to read you just a couple of verses that inform uh, how we choose to lead as elders here and how we strive to care for the flock. The first is Acts 20, 28. This is um, an admonition given to elders. It says, uh, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock. This is the church. The flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. This is another word for elder. Pay attention to yourselves in the flock to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his blood. And we're reminded that Jesus loved the church enough to die for it. And he has appointed us as overseers to care for the flock. And to be there to encourage, to exhort, to help as overseers, shepherding the flock. And then there's even greater clarity in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, where every believer is called to obey your leaders and submit to them. But there's, there's a detail here that gets to us with regard to the responsibility of elders in the church. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. We recognize that one day we'll stand before God and He's going to say, Hey, how'd you do it shepherding so-and-so? And they were in your church. What was the condition of their soul? Now, this is not easy, by the way. We have six elders here in this church. And, uh, man, it's hard to learn everyone's name, much less know the condition of their soul. In Exodus chapter 18, we, we see a picture. It is, uh, it's Moses, and he's standing as the judge over all the people in the nation of Israel. And it says that from early morning until dark, he would... Stand up before the people and he would judge, you know, disputes and, you know, kind of render judgments on their behalf. And his father-in-law, Jethro, comes to him and he says, Moses, what are you doing? Man, you're going to, this isn't good. You're going to wear yourself out. And he gives him a piece of wisdom that Moses ultimately implemented. And he says, what you need to do is, is put faithful and capable men in charge and appoint them over groups of thousands or hundreds, fifties, or even tens, and, and let them judge between the people. And if there are difficult issues, they can bring them to you, but let them serve you, and everyone's going to be better for it. And here at Cross Community, we're not a tiny church. We're too big for six guys to know the condition of every soul. And so we have appointed faithful, capable men and women who lead our community groups and who are there to keep watch over your souls, who care for you when life gets difficult read an article that is it's really, it's challenged me. It's an article by a couple of guys that they sought to study why some 40 million people have left the church over the last 25 years. Yes, in America, 40 million fewer people attend church than they did 25 years ago. And as they looked at all the reasons for why people no longer attend church, there were some that you might expect, like politics and you know, a crisis of faith. Maybe someone had really hurt them. The church were, you know, a bunch of hypocrites or whatever it might have been. But you know what the number one reason was that accounted for 75% of people who stopped attending church over the last 25 years? This is 30 million people, by the way. This is the reason. They simply got disconnected. That something happened in their life, whether it was a marriage or divorce or the birth of a child or a, a financial loss of some sort, whether it was a job change or a move or COVID, somewhere along the way they started attending a little less frequently and a little less frequently until they didn't attend at all. And they've never returned. Can I just be frank and honest with you? 
my concern for many of you here as your pastor, and I love you, is that the same thing is going to happen to you. And one, two, five, or ten years from now, you're going to look back and think, man, what happened? And it's simply going to be that you got disconnected. What I would ask you to do is to join this church, become a member, get into a community group, into a group of people who are committed to walking with you through the ups and the downs, the good and the bad of life, through the changes that might ultimately happen, who are not going to let you simply stop showing up, who are going to show up at your house when life happens and when difficult times come. They're going to help you follow Jesus even as you help them follow Jesus. I'm going to ask you to enter into this deep, rich, abiding relationship with God and other people where you pursue full devotion to Jesus Christ together. Why do we bet the farm on community? Because God created us for it. Number two, that's because that's where discipleship happens. And number three, it's because our elders want to be faithful to God in the way that we shepherd this flock. We need to know your names. We need to know that you're cared for. We truly desire, we love, and we value you and want you to be a part of what God is doing in our church. So I have four quick applications for you today. Number one, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to trust the God who sees all of your sins and flaws and failure and yet loves you more than you could ever imagine. Maybe today, as we have a quick time of invitation, right there in your seat, you just need to pour your heart out to God. God, I'm a sinner, and I need you to save me. I need you to transform my life. I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might live a life that's ultimately pleasing to you. The way I'm going isn't working, and I need you to do something different in me today. If you have questions about that, you're going to trust Jesus today, I would love to meet with you right up here as soon as our worship service is over. Number two, if you're here and you consider this your church home, right? This is church for you. I'm going to ask you to commit yourself to community, which, as I mentioned before, it means you'll You become a member, go through our membership class, and you get into a community group, and you commit yourself there. It ain't going to be easy all the time, but I promise you it will be worth it in the end. You'll build relationships that will stick with you for the rest of your life. Maybe you're here, and you're in a community group, and it's kind of grown stale. I want to invite you to recommit yourself to community. There are four core values we have. Pursuing others relationally, living authentically, counseling each other biblically, and admonishing one another faithfully. If your group's grown stale, it's probably because you've left those core things. Get together with a group of people around the Word and pursue Jesus Christ together. And then the final thing that I want to challenge you to do. Maybe you've got a killer group and you are loving it just like the Wickwires. Maybe for you it's time to prayerfully consider stepping out and starting a new group and leading a whole new group of people as you pursue Jesus Christ and wholehearted devotion to him together. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are a God who came and rescued us. God, you saved us from our sin and you saved us for a new life with you. That you're a God who loves us unconditionally and you teach us to do the same for each other. Lord, I pray that our church truly would make fully devoted disciples. I pray that we would be a people who are devoted to you and one another as your word has called us to. And I pray that those relationships would be transformational in our lives. May we leave this place and the people who aren't here, who are outsiders, would would look upon us with favor in all the way that we love and care for one another. Father, may your spirit lead us to true and full devotion to you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing?